I'm going to use for a subject this evening the Lordship of Christ. And for a text, we turn to the book of Philippians. Second chapter, verses 9, 10, and 11. Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The Lordship of Christ. Back in March of this year, NBC tried to convince us that we live against the backdrop of a soap opera mystique. Like as the world turns, the young and the restless are on a search for tomorrow. They're aware that the days of our lives are lived one day at a time. <clears throat> but they live it on the edge of night and they are searching for the guiding light. And if they miss it, they'll wind up in General Hospital. <laughs> we live in a sadly sick society. Do you know people still think that they can find peace of mind in pills? They try to eat their way to ecstasy. They try to drink their way to pleasure. They try to smoke their way to settled nerves. They try to puff their way to popularity and push their way to power. They try to bully their way to friendship and bum their way to world peace. But I know where a poor man has a chance. I know where a sick man can get well. I know where an ignorant man can become wise. I know where a bad man can be made good. I know where a good man can be made better and even a dead man can be made alive in Jesus Christ. You know, we are forever blowing bubbles, looking for ships that never come in, chasing pots of gold at the end of receding rainbows. Now, when a child blows bubbles, he's not concerned about values. He's thrilled as long as the bubble lasts, and when it bursts, he simply blows another. How do you expect your ships to come in when you've sent no ships out? And you never will find that proverbial pot of gold because you try to ignore him who has a rainbow wrapped around his shoulder. You remember back during the 60s, the offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface play pins and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now that shouldn't have been surprising to us because the Bible has informed us that the fool had said in his heart, there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions like, who assassinated God? What coroner was called? 
who signed his death certificate, who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased. In what obituary column did you find his name? And why was I not notified? I'm a member of the family. God is spirit. He does not die by assassination. He does not die by pron pronouncement. He does not die by denial. He just does not die. He's as real today as he was to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you'll trust him, he will be as true to you as he was to Abram when Abram was called to go out not knowing whether he went. If you'll trust him, he will be as evident to you as he was to Moses when God manifested himself in a burning bush. Now, when they couldn't get anywhere with the God is dead idea, even in these 80s, one of the top theological questions is, where did God come from? Now, the primary purpose of God in creation was to prepare a moral being spiritually and intellectually capable of worshiping him. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when there was empty blackness and void formlessness and darkness was on the face of the deep, when time was yet unknown, thou in thy bliss and majesty did live and love alone. He called light out of dark, he called cosmos out of chaos. That is, he called order out of confusion. But the question still clamors for an answer. Where did God come from? And the answer is he came from nowhere. Now that's theologically correct and it's biblically sound. For Habakkuk said, I saw him when he left the hills of Teman, the Holy One from Mount Paran. And Teman simply means nothing or nowhere. So he came from nowhere. I made that statement in Detroit some time ago and a man talked with me after the meeting and he said, Preacher, let's be reasonable about this thing. You were up there tonight talking about God came from nowhere and that doesn't make sense. Let's be reasonable about it. I said, all right, if you just want to be reasonable about it, the reason God came from nowhere, there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And the reason he had to stand on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. And standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach and caught something when there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. <laughs> now you'll find that in Job 26 and 7, that he hung this world on nothing. Standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will and he struck the anvil of his omnipotence and sparks flew therefrom. And he caught them on the tips of his fingers and flung them out into space and bedecked the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. The reason nobody said anything, there wasn't anybody there to say anything. So God himself said, that's good. And God has given Christ a name that's above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The hinges of human history have turned by the strength of the insignificant man who has linked his life with the Lordship of Christ. Rivers of civilization have cut new courses because of the courage of men who have come under the loving lordship of Jesus. But the question is being asked, is this topic relevant? What is in it for us in our kind of a day? Well, for the lost, if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart, that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For the municipality, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that building. 
except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. For the nation, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. For those who claim to be committed, acknowledgement of Christ's authority must be accompanied by absolute obedience to his commandment. We heard Jesus ask one day, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? There are four classes of men who may be described by their relationship to the Lord. One, those who neither call him Lord, nor do the things which he says. Two, those who call him Lord, but do not the things which he says. Three, those who do not call him Lord, but do the things which he says. Four, those who both call him Lord and do the things which he says. Now, Lord is not a word to be taken upon our lips lightly and glibly and meaninglessly. It is a title which must be taken upon our lips with godly fear. We can see what Jesus meant when he said, Not everyone who says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Everyone is mastered by someone or something. Christ alone deserves first place. We need a strength stronger than ourselves. We need a strength strong enough to help us to stand the stresses and the strains of our struggles. And the rightful Lord of our lives is Jesus Christ. Now, in order for him to be the Prince of Peace to you, a coronation service must take place. You must crown him king in your own heart. Wherefore God hath highly exalted him and given him a name that's above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now these are the words of that man who walked all over the pagan world turned every house into a chapel and every street corner into a pulpit to proclaim the unsearchable riches of Christ. He lit the lamp of the gospel even in Caesar's household. He disturbed the nest of eagles and sent them screaming across the Roman sky. He honeycombed the land with the Christian church and then sat in Nero's cell in chains and conquered Rome by writing letters. In his letter to the Philippians, Paul penned the arrest and announcement that God has given Christ a name that's above every name. And he envisioned the time when every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In his letter to the Colossians, Paul declared that Jesus has the unqualified supremacy. He is the image of the invisible God. He is the firstborn over all creation. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the head of the church in all things. He has the preeminence. He precedes all others in his priority. And he exceeds all others in his superiority. He succeeds all others in his finality. For he's the master of the mighty. He's the captain of the conquerors. He's the head of the heroes. He's the leader of the legislators. He's the overseer of the overcomers. He's the governor of governors. He's the prince of princes. He's the king of kings, and he's the Lord of lords. Yes, he is Lord. In his letter to the Romans, Paul declared that we all belong to Christ, and we are responsible ultimately to him for everything that we do. We live unto the Lord, and when we die, we die unto the Lord. Yea, the great end with which Christ died and lived now for always is that he might be Lord, both of the dead and the living. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now the word Lord simply means having power or authority. The Great Commission is based on the claims of our Savior's Lordship. 
Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Now, Lord means ownership. His ownership is based on his lordship, and his lordship is based on his ownership. The earth is the Lord, the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein, for he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. He's the Lord. Now, he didn't have to put his signature in the corner of a sunrise. He's the owner. Nobody else is going to cause a sun to rise. He didn't have to put a laundry mark in the lapel of a meadow. He's the owner. He didn't have to carve his initials in the side of the mountain. He's the owner. He didn't even have to put a brand on the cattle of a thousand hills. He's the owner. He didn't have to take out a copyright on the songs that he gives the birds to sing. He's the owner. Beyond the human level, the word Lord stands as a reverent allusion to God. The orthodox Hebrew in Jesus' day is in our own would not even pronounce the sacred name God, Jehovah, or Yahweh. Instead, when he read the sacred and incommunicable name of God, he would simply say, The Lord. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, Christians have applied this title to Christ in the latter usage on either the human or divine level, the title Lord is a mark of respect, an implied pledge of obedience. Once Simon Peter stood before a hostile crowd and said, God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now Christ represents the thing that God hath done to redeem us. Lord represents what we ought to do, not to be redeemed, but because we are redeemed. We ought to call him master and be obedient servants to him. We ought to call him owner because he possesses absolutely our lives. In him we live and move and have our being. We ought to call him father and be obedient sons and daughters, for he's our only hope and he is our only help. That's the reason I like what David said, God is our refuge and our strength. He's a very present help in trouble. Therefore shall not we fear, though the earth be removed and though the mountains be carried unto the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, Though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof, there is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, and she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved, yet at his voice the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Come behold the works of the Lord. What desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh walls to cease unto the ends of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. And burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. Jesus Christ is Lord because he came down the stairway of heaven, born in Bethlehem, hid in Egypt, brought up in Nazareth, baptized in Jordan, tempted in the wilderness. He performed miracles by the roadside. He healed multitudes without medicine and made no charges for his service. He conquered everything that came up against him. He took your sins and mine and went out on Calvary and there died. 
While on that cross, Jesus said several things in teaching us how to forgive. We heard him say, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. In teaching us how to comfort, we heard him say to a repentant thief, This day shalt thou be with me in paradise. We heard him say, in teaching us how to sympathize, Woman, behold thy son, and son, behold thy mother. In teaching us how to endure, we heard him say, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then, in teaching us how to suffer, we heard him say, I thirst. In teaching us how to accomplish, we heard him say, It is finished. Then teaching us how to die, we heard him say, Father, into thy hand I commend my spirit. But when the thief taunted him and said, If you be the Christ, come down from the cross and save yourself. And while you're at it, save us. To that taunt, Jesus never said a mumbling word, but the silence seemed to say, You just wait until Sunday morning. And I'll show you that it's better to come up out of a grave than it is to come down from a cross. And he dropped his head in the locks of his shoulder and he died. Yes, he died. Don't you let anybody fool you. He died. When he died, the earth had a cosmic fit. When he died, well, the sun bowed its head behind the curtains of eternity. When he died, the insects crawled back in their holes and the chickens went to roost at noonday. When he died, the grave had a spasm and the dead got up out of the grave and walked the streets after his resurrection. He died. Well, the dismembered spirits tiptoed around Calvary, checking on the crucifixion. And the gray horse pawed in the valley, what if they're saying that Jesus has died. Women wept and children Oh, beheld this dreadful scene and the cruel Roman soldier said surely this was the son of God the curtains in the veil of the temple were rent in twain I'm trying to tell you he died well I don't like to stay that long talking about he died I like to rush on and say he was buried in Joseph new tomb buried in a borrowed tomb now that used to bother me buried in a borrowed tomb the one who holds the waters in the hall of his hand and meets out the heavens with a span, who comprehends the dust and weighs the mountains in the scale and the hill in the balance, being buried in a bar or two. Well, he wasn't going to stay there long, so a temporary tomb would suffice. He just went down in the grave and cleaned out the grave and made it a pleasant place to wait for the resurrection. And just like the Bible said he would, he got up with every form of power in the orbit of his omnipotence. Jesus Christ is Lord. You know, men have been wondering uh, when is he going to relinquish his power. Uh, they say, well, if we wait long enough, maybe his power will fail him or maybe somebody will destroy his power. Let me ask you something, mister. If you're going to destroy his power, what are you going to use for power? If you try to destroy him by fire, he'll refuse to burn. If you try to destroy him by water, he'll walk on the water. If you try to destroy him by strong wind, the tempest will lick his hand and lay down at his feet. If you try to destroy him by law, you'll find no fault in him. If you try to destroy him by the seal of an empire, he'll break it. If you try to destroy him by putting him in a grave, thank God he'll rise. If you try to destroy him by rejecting him or ignoring him, soon you hear a still small voice saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man will open the door, I'll come in and sup with him and he with me. Jesus Christ is Lord. Hey, Jesus Christ is the pearl from paradise He's the gem from the glory land. He's truth's fairest jewel, and he's time's choicest theme. He's life's strongest cord, and he's light's clearest ray. He's purity's whitest peak, 
and his joy's deepest tide, where his name stands as a synonym for free healing, friendly help, and full salvation. His blessed name is like honey to the taste, is like harmony to the ear, is like health to the soul, is like hope to the heart. Jesus is Lord. He's higher than the heavens of heavens, and he's holier than the holy of holies. In his birth is our significance. In his life is our example. In his cross is our redemption. In his resurrection is our hope. At his birth, men came from the east. At his death, men came from the west. And the east and the west met in him. Hallelujah, the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. And at his name, to his name, in his name, every knee. Did you hear me say every knee? Every knee, the black knee, every knee, the white knee, every knee, the young knee, every knee, the old knee, every knee, wounded knee, every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Just don't let it be said too late. That tongue is going to confess, yes. Don't let it be said too late. There are some who says, I've got a lot of living to do. You don't really live until you come to him who said, I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. And then I hear some praying, Lord, when I must go somewhere, crawl up in a dying bed and learn how to die. Who told you you were going anywhere else? And who told you you were going to have the strength or the time to crawl up in a dying bed? And who told you that you were going to have to learn how to die? Dying's going to take care of itself. You learn how to live. And as you live, so you die. Oh, I'll admit that borderline salvation is better than being lost. But that's too dangerous to risk. That's the reason the prophet said, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he's near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And he will have mercy to our God for he will abundantly pardon. I'm not going to wait. I acknowledge him as my Savior, my Lord, now. I bow on my knees and cry holy. I fear him because of his power. I love him because of his wisdom. I trust him because of his goodness. I praise him because of his greatness. I believe in him because of his faithfulness. I adore him because of his holiness. The Lord is my light and my salvation. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my salvation. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my deliverer. The Lord is my high tower. The Lord is my shield and buckler. Yes, the Lord is plain and profound. The Lord is simple and sublime. The Lord is suitable and serviceable. Yes, he's Lord. The Lord is a fountain of every excellence. He's a mirror of perfection. He's a light of heaven. He's the wonder of the world. Yes, he's Lord, he's time's masterpiece, and he's eternity's glory. Yes, he's Lord. He's a morning without a cloud. He's a day without a night. He's a rose without a thorn. He's a mountain without a valley. He's a light without darkness. He's health without sickness. He's strength without weakness. He is truth without error. He's life without death. Yes, he's Lord. And I love that. He's my Lord. Yes, he is. And I can brag. Yes, I can. Because I've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. I can boast. I can brag. Believe me, the Lord is my shepherd. Beside me are the still waters. Beneath me are the green pastures. Before me is a table prepared. Between me at home lies the valley and the shadow of death. 
and behind me goodness and mercy yes and beyond me looms the house of the Lord forever <laughs> yes I'm glad yes I am that I know the Lord uh, he is not only Lord but he's my Lord <laughs> is he your Lord well if he's not he can be right now <laughs> there he is a land that's fairer than day <laughs> yes it is <laughs> and by faith we can see the fall father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet when did you say I said in the sweet when in the sweet by and by we shall meet on that beautiful show what you talking about preacher where is it I don't know where it is but it's out there somewhere yes I've got a home beyond the hills and the horizon yes I've got a mansion beyond the mist and the mountains I've got a possession beyond the plains and the planets I've got a society beyond the stars and the sky I've got a paradise beyond the perils and the pains of this present time good God Almighty when I get there yes I'll dwell in the house of the Lord forever you talking about joy in the house of the Lord yes yes will you be there if you be there don't you think you're gonna sit there quiet in the house of the Lord that's gonna be shouting yes in the house of the Lord yes if you're gonna be still and quiet you're gonna get run over in the house of the Lord yeah you know we we are just having a rehearsal down here we're getting ready we're just practicing down here what are we going to do when we get on the other side now if you can't act right in the rehearsal you're not going to be in the performance hey we'll be in the house of the lord forever i'll dwell in the house of the lord yes jesus christ is lord let him be your lord tonight let him be your shepherd